I'm Steve Webster. I'm a retired marine biologist from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, one of the four people who actually thought up the aquarium project and got it going in 1976. It's safe to say the aquarium as a project began at Hopkins Marine Station. Uh, three of the four of us were graduate students at Hopkins, Stanford's Marine Biology Station, and the fourth was a faculty member there. Uh, Hopkins is next door to the Houghton Cannery, the largest of the canneries on Cannery Row and the last of the canneries to close. Stanford purchased that cannery in 1965 so that a large hotel wouldn't be built there right next to the Marine Station. And so grad students at, at Hopkins in those days uh, often had their TGIFs over at the cannery. We would go out on one of the old fish holding tanks overlooking the bay and that's where we had our Friday evening parties. Uh, two of the four of us just happened to be daughter and son-in-law of David and Lucille Packard, the co-founder of Hewlett Packard. And the Burnettes were living in Carmel Valley in the uh, mid-70s and I was teaching at San Jose State. And I would come down here weekends to dive to collect for my invertebrate zoology classes at San Jose State and then spend the night with the Burnettes in Carmel Valley. And some of those visits we began talking about what it might be interesting to do with that old cannery next door to the marine station. And sometime in about 1976 somebody said the word aquarium. I, we think it was probably Nancy Burnett. Uh, the Packard's oldest daughter. And so we started grabbing a hold of that and running with it for a few months and got to the point that we had a pretty solid vision for an aquarium on the site of the Hoveden Cannery. And Robin Burnett wrote up a case statement for that concept and we took it to David and Lucille Packard uh, they were quite interested. Uh, both Nancy and her younger sister Julie were trained in marine biology on Monterey Bay, so there was a family interest in marine biology and, and natural history of this area. And so David Packard uh, commissioned a marketing feasibility study that came through in 1977 and was quite encouraging. It suggested that a, uh, an aquarium built on that site might actually uh, have 350,000 visitors its first year. As it turns out, our first year in 1984, we had 2.1 million visitors. So the marketing study missed, but fortunately it missed in the right direction. When that study came in, uh, the Packards decided, well, this sounds interesting, let's, let's move ahead. And so they formed a nonprofit foundation to plan and build and operate the aquarium. I took a leave of absence from San Jose State and became what we called the project coordinator. Uh, worked with the Packards to put together a board of trustees to find architects and engineers and exhibit designers. And in the summer of 1978, I moved down to Pacific Grove, took a leave of absence from San Jose State, and we actually occupied some empty, unused lab space at Hopkins uh, to begin working with the architects and engineers to plan the aquarium. Chuck Baxter, Robin and Nancy Burnett, and I became basically the planning group for the aquarium, and once it looked as though the project was really a go, Julie Packard left her job up in Santa Cruz and we became a gang of five. 
it was an ideal situation because we could literally look over the shoulders of the architects every day as they started to put pencil to paper and convert our ideas into uh, something uh, solid on, on the, uh, the footprint of the old cannery. Early on it became clear that this was not a remodel project. Uh, those canneries were all built according to no particular standards and the, the building was so dilapidated that there really was nothing that could be saved even though they had been canning squid there in the summers up until 1972. So most of the cannery had to come down. Uh, the old warehouse building was very solid. That's where they packed and labeled and then shipped all the sardines and squid on the railroad that ran right behind the cannery and that railroad uh, right-of-way is now the recreational trail all the way along the waterfront here. Uh, so that building we could retain and remodel for our shops and offices. All the rest of the cannery basically had to come down with one exception and that was the boiler house. Those boilers still stand as sculpture and as the centerpiece for the Cannery Row Museum that is now at the aquarium. The old steel rusty smokestacks came down because they were very dangerous and we put up new fiberglass smokestacks that are fake but they uh, make the building look very much like the old Hubden Cannery did. In fact, the Monterey Planning Commission uh, asked that the building retain its, its uh, external features to look very much like the cannery. And so even the bridge going across Cannery Row to the Education Building is an exact replica of the bridge that used to bring fish meal across Cannery Row to be bagged on the, on the railroad side of the road. The program for the aquarium from its earliest time was envisioned as a walk through the marine and shoreline habitats of Monterey Bay. All of us were divers. Uh, we were very familiar both with the intertidal and the subtidal communities uh, in and around the bay. And we basically wanted to share that with folks who would never be able to strap on scuba tanks and see what it really looked like under there. And we thought we could have in our living exhibits whole pieces of living communities, not just tanks of fishes, which is what most big public aquariums were about in those days, but to have what we called the habitats path. So beginning with the kelp forest, which was our crown jewel exhibit, have a walk through the aquarium go from one habitat to another and display real pieces of living communities. So it's not just the fishes, it's also the seaweeds and the invertebrates like sea stars, sea anemones, and so forth. We felt we could do this because Monterey Bay is a relatively clean body of water. No major industry around the bay, no huge municipal outfalls, and Monterey Bay is very deep and well circulated. So even though we have agricultural runoff from the Salinas Valley uh, and an occasional sewage spill from a dilapidated sewage system, uh, it's still relatively clean water, and so we're able to pump 2,000 gallons per minute, day and night, through the exhibits at the aquarium. That raw seawater provides us with the spores of seaweeds and the larvae of invertebrates to occupy space on the rocks and so forth in the exhibits. Also provides the plankton that many of the exhibit animals feed on. And so it's that fact that we are on good, clean seawater that we can use day and night in large amounts that really makes these community exhibits possible at the aquarium. So we're in a really perfect location to have this kind of a program in mind. The kelp forest we thought of as the crown jewel exhibit because it is spectacular. A kelp forest on a bright sunny day with the light filtering down through those kelp fronds is kind of like an underwater cathedral and 
the challenge there was that no one had ever grown a kelp forest in an aquarium before. And so we decided, well, I'll bet we can do this. We just need to learn to think like a kelp. And Julie Packard got her degree at UC Santa Cruz in marine algae, and so she talked to some folks in Southern California who were culturing kelp, and they were encouraging. They said, sure, you ought to be able to do it. And so the kelp forest exhibit is open to the sky, so it gets full sunlight all day long. There's a wave machine to keep the water in motion, and that isn't just for effect. It's also because you have to keep the water moving around the kelp fronds, or they deplete the nutrients so quickly that they get starved for nutrients. So the wave machine helps keep the water moving, and we also pump 4,000 gallons per minute through that exhibit to help keep the nutrient level up. And indeed, the kelps grow just as about as fast in that exhibit as they do out in nature, which is about six inches per day during the spring and summer growth season. Imagine if your front lawn grew that fast, the neighbor's kid would be out there mowing it every hour on the hour. So the kelp forest worked, most of our other community exhibits worked, and we opened with that Habitat's Path in October of 1984. Uh, a couple of very successful years. Uh, after the first year, all of the school programs were made free. We also built the education building, and at that point, David Packard saw that the, ex the aquarium was so successful that he purchased the cannery next door, the Sea Pride cannery, and that became our expansion location for the Outer Bay, for the big million gallon Outer Bay exhibit, and then downstairs two special exhibition galleries where we have exhibits that usually last about three years and then we rotate them there. Uh, right now it's seahorses in one of those and hot pink flamingos, the climate change exhibit in the other. And so those special exhibition areas give us an opportunity to break out of our habitat path program, our regional program, and do exhibits on critters from other parts of the world, like Magellanic penguins, flamingos, green sea turtles, seahorses from all over the tropics. Uh, in addition to those exhibit programs, which have been very successful, the aquarium has also grown a good deal in other programmatic areas. Uh, we do outreach to schools, we do summer training programs for science teachers, uh, we have a large membership and do evening and, and summer members programs, uh, and recently the Center for the Conservation of the Ocean actually the Center for the Future of the Ocean, the CFFO, which includes the Seafood Watch Program, is more of a grad, grassroots advocacy kind of a, of a program to really try and push forward various projects in marine conservation, not just locally, but even globally. Early on, we became interested in the largest habitat in Monterey Bay, indeed the largest habitat on Earth, the deep sea, uh, and began thinking about how we might do exhibits and or get involved in research in the deep sea since we have Monterey Canyon right out here that's two and a half miles deep. Uh, and initially it was thought that the deep sea research element might be a part of the, the uh, aquarium research program. Uh, Julie Packard and others realized that very quickly that could become such a large program that it could overtake the aquarium. Uh, and so that was created as a separate institution. Ambari is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute centered over at Moss Landing. They do deep sea research and research technology development, but it is a separate institution. We share some board members. Uh, we share a lot of programmatic activities like the uh, link we have to their ship and remotely operated sub 
that we can share with folks in our auditorium uh, many days of the week. In order to display California sea otters, uh, we basically became the first aid station for the California sea otter population. So we have really two separate elements to the sea otter program. One is the otters on exhibit uh, in the sea otter exhibit at the aquarium. Those are rehabilitated otters that are not appropriate to go back to nature and so live out their lives in the exhibit. But those otters also very often became, become surrogate mothers to orphaned and injured sea otter pups that come into the aquarium having washed up on a beach somewhere and then they are nursed back to health by our sea otter staff. We knew that sea otters would be of great interest to the, to the public once because they're, they're engaging animals, they, they have that charismatic quality to them, but also because it's an important story. They were hunted to near extinction along this coast in the 17 and 1800s for the fur trade and then they were rediscovered off Big Sur. Uh, early in the 1900s, the people who lived along the Big Sur coast knew there were a few otters down there, but that word didn't get out very, very broadly. It wasn't until Highway 1 was constructed, I believe in about 1938, that it became general public knowledge that, oh my gosh, there still is a population of sea otters here, somewhere between 30 and 50 animals. That population has grown slowly over the years. It's now at around 2,500 animals, I believe, and it's been stuck at about that number for at least 10 or 15 years. Uh, exactly why it is not expanding and continuing to reoccupy its former range up and down the coast is a matter of considerable speculation and a lot of research going on right now by a number of different universities and, and agencies. Uh, but because of the very limited range and number of otters in California, they are listed as a threatened population of the sea otter under the Endangered Species Act. Not an endangered species, there are several thousand of them up in Alaska as well, but this is regarded as a threatened population. So there has to be a recovery program to try and get them off that listing and a part of that is to try and nurture injured and orphaned pups and injured adults back to health and get them back out into the natural population. In order to get the permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service to display California sea otters in our exhibit, we agreed to become basically the first aid station for the sea otter population. And so that's where our sea otter rescue and care program, the SORAC program, uh, originated and continues to be a, a very active and, and important program at the aquarium. In a typical year, we might get half dozen to a dozen orphaned pups that need to be nursed back to health and, and returned to nature. The, uh, the other aspect of that program is a population study where we have staff and volunteers with high-powered spotting scopes observing sea otters all up and down the coast, many of them with tags so they can be identified as individual otters, keeping track of their movement patterns how often a given female is giving birth, what her success rate is in raising that pup, how many females are being mated by one territorial male within the range, and, and so forth. The other major research effort at the aquarium is the white shark research program. Great white sharks along this coast uh, are not very well understood they are impacted by fisheries, particularly in Southern California, where a good many young of the year white sharks are caught inadvertently as bycatch in 
fisheries for other target species in Southern California, like white sea bass and halibut and so forth. And so there are two main components to the white shark research program. One is to put satellite tags on young of the year white sharks and then release them in Southern California and follow them for a period of months or even up to a year so that we can fill in a big gap. Uh, where do they go during their first few years of life? What are they doing? Because after they leave the beaches of Southern California in the late summer, as young of the year sharks that are maybe four and a half or five feet long, we don't see them again along this coast until they're young adults, seven, eight, nine feet long. So if you want to engage in a conservation program for white sharks, you need to know what they're up to and where they're going at these different stages of their lives. If during this process of tagging young white sharks uh, off Southern California in the summer, we get one who is in really good condition, uh, then we will transport that shark to the aquarium and have it on display as an ambassador for white sharks worldwide for about six months in our large Outer Bay exhibit. Uh, we've had, I believe, five of them all together and the tagging results indicate that when we release them after about six months at the aquarium, they turn left, they go south and those satellite tags have popped up off San Simeon in the case of a three-month tag, off the tip of Baja California in the case of a six-month tag, and almost down to Acapulco in the case of a nine-month tag. So not much question but that young of the year white sharks go to Mexico, apparently grow up there, and then we start seeing them again along this coast as young adults. This information has, of course, been possible only because of the arrival of satellite tagging technology that's used not just on white sharks, but on tunas and other species of sharks, even sea turtles, albatross, some marine mammals, and so forth. And so by satellite, we are now able to track many different kinds of animals all over the North Pacific, figure out what they're doing out there when they're basically out of sight and, and out of mind. So a couple of years ago, we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And if I were to give a summary of uh, the overall effect of having the aquarium here during those 25 years, I would say this. First of all, we have had about 30 million visitors at the aquarium during that time. People who are now much more familiar with what goes on in and around Monterey Bay, some of the richest and most diverse marine habitats anywhere, certainly along a temperate coast. And more recently, with our emphasis on marine conservation, have had a chance to let people know that this largest habitat on Earth is not without problems, that our activities, such as global warming, such as acidification of the ocean, such as plastics in the ocean, such as overfishing, have had profound effects on ocean communities, many of which are in trouble. And so even though it's out of sight and out of mind, we hope we're having the effect of letting people know that we really have to be cognizant of what it is we're doing to this planet and in particular to these ocean communities.